Thank you very much. Uh, good morning, everyone, ladies and gentlemen. It is a real pleasure to be here again, uh, talking to this uh, auditorium and having the pleasure to participate in the event organized by ICD. So thank you very much for uh, having me back to your, uh, to your very important uh, event. I am going to use a couple of slides, probably not all of them. Uh, what I would like to convey is a message of uh, hope. And it is uh, very important that in times of crisis, we are in a position to convey a message of hope and to explain why hope is really something that uh, uh, is not only what we need, but it is a very realistic prospect for the future of, uh, of Europe. Uh, those of you that were here uh, when I uh, first appeared in this uh, forum probably remember that uh, I had very kind, optimistic, strong words about Europe. Some of you could even remember that I compared Europe, the European Union, the European uh, uh, build-up as such so essential things like breathing. You probably recalled that I even did that. I, 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 I did inspire and expiring is something so natural, so uh, common, that we never think about its significance. We only think about how important it is when you, you don't have oxygen. Then it becomes really a huge thing, a huge problem, a vital, a vital thing. So, and I uh, uh, tried to argue that the same applies to Europe and to the European Union. It is so overwhelmingly important that you only realize its sheer importance when it starts to fail. And um, this is a very appropriate uh, uh, thought to start with, especially now in uh, 2014. We are not only celebrating 100 years that uh, uh, Europe lost uh, an immense opportunity to avoid a war, and so we are now 100 years after the, the last summer of Europe, but we are also celebrating the 25th anniversary of the fall of the Berlin Wall, and we are celebrating in 2014 the 40th anniversary of the Portuguese Democratic Revolution back in 74. And those of you that uh, follow the, the writings of Huntington know about the importance of the Portuguese Democratic Revolution because that democratic change triggered what Huntington called afterwards the third wave of revolutions, creating really in uh, many countries in Latin America, in Europe, in Africa, prospects for a brighter future. And those prospects were apparently put in jeopardy recently with the economic and financial crisis. And I would like very briefly to, to, to lead you through some of the key aspects of the crisis, then to try to understand where we are and uh, where we think that we should go from here, and of course to be at your disposal to answer questions about the present and the future of Europe and its impact on the overall, the overall uh, world uh, context. Let me start uh, by asking a very obvious question. We have a crisis, we are having a crisis, Everybody talks about the crisis. It is the word in the, in the back mind and in the mouth of everyone. But what kind of crisis? We know now that uh, the reasons for the crisis are very well identified. Nobody disputes that the crisis was essentially a combination of these three dimensions. It was 
obviously a crisis of the banking system and of the financial system was also very much a crisis of the lack of competitiveness of businesses in a global economy and it was in some countries, especially in the southern rim of Europe, but also in Ireland and in other countries, a crisis of over-indebtedness. So we all know that. All the economists would agree that the recent crisis that struck the world economy, in particular the e economies of uh, the European Union member nations, in, s in particular those that belong to the common currency, is a creation of uh, these three essential dimensions creating the perfect uh, storm. Um, and when the crisis came, it found the European financial and economic and monetary system in a very unbalanced situation. So that's what this slide tries to represent. We had a very integrated monetary policy, 17 of the then 27 member nations of the European Union had a very integrated monetary policy, even a common currency represented that integrated monetary poli policy, but on the other hand, there was no coordination of the economic policy. And this is very important, this slide, because you could be wonder, wondering why a system so unbalanced as this one could have worked. And it worked for a relative long period of time for essentially two main reasons. The first reason is that there was no crisis. And because there was no crisis, there was no incentive to change. There was no incentive to create a better or more balanced system. And the second reason, probably the most important reason, is that if you start to better coordinate our macroeconomic policies, you are touching the real inner core of the sovereignty, privileges, and prerogatives of the different member nations of the European Union. You cannot really actually coordinate on the macroeconomic level without touching the prerogatives of the parliaments and of the governments across the board. So it was very comfortable, it was very convenient not to create more stringent macroeconomic policy coordination mechanisms. The only that we had until recently is, as you know, was, as you know, recommendations from the European Commission to the different member states that would need to be approved by the Council of the European Union under the less stringent rule according to the treaties, that of a qualified majority. And then, after that very loose process, the countries were recommended by the European Commission to adopt some coordinating economic policy measures. So essentially a very unbalanced system, as you can see, but worked because of what I just told you. So again, we have on that other plate of the balance, the integrated monetary policy, as I said, the most perfect way of integrating any monetary policy is to have a common currency. So better you cannot do, more integrated you cannot have. So when the crisis came, you had only two options. So the politicians had no other option than to choose between creating a more loose monetary policy, meaning expelling some countries from the euro, from the common currency, or choosing a different path that is creating a much more uh, a much greater integration of the different macroeconomic policies. And it is no surprise to anyone, and it is very important to say that again and again in a very clear way, that all the member nations of the European Union that 
belong to the eurozone, to the common currency, all of them, with no exception, decided to follow the path of a deeper integrated macroeconomic coordination of policies. And uh, the vast majority of the countries that uh, are outside the Eurozone also agreed to the idea that what we need as a path to overcome the crisis is better, more integrated macroeconomic policy coordination. And to do that, to do that, it, it seems very easy. We all know it is extremely complex, extremely ambitious, uh, extremely forward-looking. But to do that, you need, on the economic and financial side, you need uh, agreements on uh, the, MF, the MFF and other mechanisms. You need to deepen, of course, what is now called the Economic and Monetary Union. But you also need, on the political side of the house, to create the conditions for deepening the European Union and keeping the democratic legitimacy of our institutions. And you know what happened. We started the process of deepening the Economic and Monetary Union. I am not going to bother you with the different uh, steps that it took already the Union to uh, go on the direction of deepening the Economic and Monetary Union, it is very important that you realize that this document that is called the blueprint uh, uh, provided by the European Commission for a deep and genuine uh, Economic and Monetary Union is the first document when you can have an idea, a glimpse of the timeline that we are talking about. So this is extremely important. It is a very important document because uh, if you look at the bottom of this chart, you will see that uh, to achieve a full banking union and to achieve a full fiscal and economic uh, union, uh, those are the main goals, the main aims of creating that better macroeconomic policy coordination. You would need more than five years, so those are objectives that are, as the chart very well uh, identifies, beyond five years. And probably even more important so is if you look at uh, the right-hand side of the uh, slide, they will imply necessarily treaty changes. So this is a huge challenge, a very big task ahead that the European Union uh, really took on its shoulders. And if you come to the very last uh, two lines of the slide, uh, when are we going to have a political union that would really incorporate and create the basis for keeping, as I said, the democratic legitimacy alongside of the integrated monetary policy, not even the Commission, there's to put a date on that. So we are talking about a long way to go, a long road still to, to travel ahead. I know and I am anticipating immediately a lot of questions. So why are we choosing this path? Are you not afraid of alienating the public opinions and the public perceptions of uh, uh, the, the different constituencies across the board about the European Union project? Don't you see the results of the last elections for the European uh, Parliament already signing a lot of alarm, ringing a lot of alarm bells? Uh, so uh, I anticipate those questions and I would be more than happy to answer to some of those during, during our, our debate. But let me tell you that uh, uh, with the notion that we are creating the mechanisms that are allowing countries to overcome the crisis, and I am very comfortable when I give the example of my own country. Uh, two years ago, two years and a half ago, uh, I started at my embassy here in Berlin a um, newsletter, um, uh, twice a month newsletter 
that we are sending out to a very big, uh, uh, very important uh, and numerous mailing list, um, and that, of course, you are also more than welcome and invited also to, to start receiving those that don't yet receive our newsletter. And the title of the newsletter is Towards the Economic Recovery, Portugal Towards the Economic, the Road Towards the Economic Recovery. And two years ago, two years and a half ago, a lot of people, friends, uh, colleagues, uh, uh, diplomats, economists, bankers, would uh, immediately ask me, seriously, are you really serious about saying that Portugal is on the road towards economic recovery? Today, nobody disputes that. Uh, we fulfilled the obligations of the commitments we took with the international financial institutions. We are out of those programs of adjustment with a much sounder economy, fighting uh, unemployment, especially youth unemployment, and creating again and creating again economic growth. And because of examples like the example of Portugal, of Ireland, of Spain, and others, the uh, European Union Council had a very important meeting by the end of June. Um, it, is, it is very important that uh, you realize that uh, the last meeting of the European Council, which was an extraordinary council of the European Union, attracted a lot of attention from the media because it was the council when, where the leaders of the European Union were discussing the composition of the future <coughs> European Commission and the distribution of the top jobs of the European Union institutions after the European Parliament elections. It attracted a lot of attention, uh, and unfortunately, the Council immediately prior to that, in June, did not attract so much attention because it was not uh, so much about uh, posts and personalities, but that Council was about real, serious, real, serious, forward-looking strategic uh, matters, and it was, it was decided then that we would need the strategic agenda for the European Union in times of change approved, and that strategic agenda that was voted unanimously by the 28 member nations, now 28 member nations of the European Union, has five main uh, directions. I am not going to go in deep, we have no time for that, but the first is, as you can see on this slide, a union of jobs, growth, and competitiveness. Then the second strategic um, orientation, a union that empowers and protects our citizens. A union that is going towards, there is a misspelling here, to uh, energy union with a forward-looking climate policy. This is a very bold, very important uh, commitment taken by the leaders of the Union, and of course a union of freedom, of security, and of justice. And the last of the five strategic uh, trends that were approved is to make the Union a stronger global uh, actor. So what I am uh, trying to tell you in a nutshell is that uh, uh, in times of crisis, our financial institutions work in spite of all the criticism and in spite of all the scepticism and euroscepticism, of course, they work. I, I very recently, 10 days ago, um, I saw that the, the Brookings Institution in, uh, in the United States, they held the first seminar on the subject matter, how this time the financial institutions, international financial institutions worked and avoided a new 1929. So this is really extremely important that uh, at the most sophisticated, knowledgeable level, people start really to realize that the international institutions really worked. And they were not there to work back in 1929 so they could not avoid a major crisis that was the inception of a lot of uh, tragedies that unfolded in the years immediately after, and of course, 
Germany knows a lot about uh, that. So uh, a message of hope, a lot of questions I immediately anticipate, uh, also giving the hint to the, uh, uh, to the role that uh, Portugal played, becoming a success story in a very complex, complex context, but also a very committed member of uh, the idea that we need more European Union and not less European Union. Thank you very much for your attention. Uh, Mohad uh, from uh, Morocco, thank you for uh, the presentation. Uh, uh, I've uh, noted that uh, this strategy has uh, neglected the, the culture because uh, it seems that it is only economically oriented. So how far... Uh, uh, and uh, it, it seems also that this strategy in time of crisis is preventive. You see what I mean? Is preventive. How far you believe that culture is not... Uh, you are not interested uh, in the European Union uh, about culture anymore. You have had a st uh, strate cultural strategy before. What is it now? No, it is a very good question. You see, if uh, culture and uh, if culture and the cultural policies of the European Union were in crisis, they would immediately attract a lot of attention. Obviously, so I am extremely comfortable by the fact that culture is not mentioned here because we are really putting together the ingredients to overcome crisis. So I am not saying that the cultural objectives and policies of the European Union are perfect because nothing is perfect and everything can be improved. But I am very comfortable in saying that uh, if there is on earth a actor that really cares about culture, that is the European Union for sure. Um, we are really uh, living in a, in a continent and in a union that really puts the cultural aspects and issues at the very forefront of its uh, policies. Um, and the, um, the funds that every year are spent by the Union on cultural activities, on promoting, protecting, preserving cultural activities uh, is, is really without any comparison to, to anyone else. Uh, so uh, this is really the bright side of the story. Uh, of course, again, a lot can be done. There is a lot that can re really be improved. But uh, again, I am glad that uh, when we talk about remedies for the crisis, we are not trying to fix the cultural uh, perspectives, uh, prospects for the European Union. Let me, I know that we are running out of time, but let me mention uh, only one thing that is not directly related to your question, but because there is no other question, let me only tell uh, you the following as a, as a kind of a concluding remark. Uh, we, a lot of is, is being said about Eurocriticism, Euroscepticism, and the elections, the recent elections for the European Parliament are very uh, frequently invoked when we debate these matters. Uh, let me tell, in, tell, in, tell you only the following. If uh, we would have this kind of uh, vote that we had for the European Parliament in times of uh, growth, development, uh, no crisis, stability, prosperity, that would really be a big surprise for politicians, for analysts, for diplomats. So if you are in a crisis and you get the vote that you got, it is really part of the political process. It is really part of uh, daily life. It would be totally unexpected if, in times of crisis, we would have this kind of overwhelming support for the Union and for its institutions that you normally have in times of uh, plenty. So uh, nothing new also on that front. Uh, no reason to alarm. Of course, we need uh, probably to make the better that we can out of the composition of the European Parliament. One thing is obvious. The main the same political forces in the European Parliament will need to work much more in a coordinated way and in hand in hand, like it is being done here in Germany with the grand coalition that you have uh, in order really to foster and protect the European agenda. 
But again, I am totally reassured on the cultural uh, side of the equation. So thank you again for your patience and for your attention.